This is The Sailing World on Water, February 11, 2022. Lighter Winds was a nemesis for, the, for this class of yacht as a whole and some teams got around that problem better than others. But that being said, the problem was kind of inherent in the design of these boats. And a lot of the changes in the class rule have happened to attack that, that problem. So crew numbers coming down, weight coming out of foils, no code zeros, winches off the boat as well. All these changes begin to add up and you can end up with a lighter platform. And as well as the weight, the span of the foils has changed as well. So there's been a big, big push within the development of the class rule to get these boats up and out the water and falling around in, in less wind. The crews come down to eight. And another big change is that they've put a control in on how many people can provide power. So four people can provide power to the yacht and they can do that either through grinding or, or cycling or any other means if the team decides to, to go down another route. Not quite sure what that would be. That does make some pretty substantial changes to the playbook. It means that you have to free up uh, four people between them helming, piloting and trimming roles. But exactly how teams decide to break that down, I think will develop and I'm sure no team will, uh, will be exactly the same in how the playbook works. I think the AC40 should be an amazing boat to, to sail and an amazing boat to race. It's going to be nice to have some preliminary regattas to get our teeth into in the build up to AC37. The AC40 will be sailed by a crew of four and then everything will be powered by batteries. So yeah, no, no cyclers, no, no grinders on the, on the small boat and, and a four man crew. So yeah, I'm excited to see how exactly it ends up looking. Looking forward to getting out in the, in the next boat. I suppose, watch this space. Hi, my name is uh, Loïc Dorez. I'm uh, head of design for Team Malaysia. Hello, my name is Rebecca and I'm part of the design team uh, with uh, Malaysia. Hello, I'm Borja and I'm the composite manager of Malaysia team. Hello, my name is uh, Heli, I'm the build manager. Hi, my name is Marine and I'm the technical coordinator on the construction of the new boat of uh, Team Malaysia, Malaysia 3. The challenge is we have deadline with a race plus the fact that we are on a new generation of uh, Imoka boats. The biggest challenge on this project it will be the timeline and to make sure that uh, we follow the planning, which is pretty important and pretty hard to do on the construction of a boat. Make the link between the architects here inside the team. We need another 10 months with lots of help to finish this beautiful boat. That's going to be the big challenge, the planning, that's for sure. been a, a steep learning curve for all of us. You know, this time a year ago we were we still hadn't started racing in the America's Cup actually so it's easy to forget that for us guys that have been um, flat out with this boat. So it's we started later part of last year. You guys had um, a really busy build period because we had we were shut down for a little while with a lockdown. Um, we delivered it to the base over here at the VEC end of the year and, and we've been into this fit out period for the first part of this year. So all the powertrain components in, the cooling circuit is underway. Um, sort of two, three weeks from now, we'll be starting to run the boat up out on the courtyard for the first time. And then, you know, early to mid-March, we'll be looking to put the boat in the water and, and start the in-the-water testing. About 10 metres long. Uh, we've got a weight of about 5.2 tonnes. Top speed somewhere around 50 knots is what we're aiming for. In a sense, this isn't too much different to like what we did with the, the 75 last time where that hadn't been done before, uh, foiling monohull like we did and I think that's where Team New Zealand's certainly pretty strong is making these what seem like impossible tasks happen and yeah, happen to the highest level. You know, we can try and push a little bit of change in, in the marine sector by introducing this hydrogen powertrain, the first of its kind in New Zealand and one of the first in the world. So. 
it's something we're really proud of and proud of the Kiwi contingent. You know, we had um, AF Cryo early on. They did a feasibility study for us and then introduced us to Global Bus Ventures. So they've been our, like our system integrators on this project, working with, with ourselves, our mechatronics team and Toyota to, to come up with this system architecture for the hydrogen powertrain. And um, it's just a project we are immensely proud of. For a long time, French sailing photographer, Christophe Favreau, has been taking photos of the 18-footer fleet on Sydney Harbour. This month he's working for us at the Sailing World on Water, and we asked him for his thoughts on the racing. Here's Christophe. Race 1. The Andu team of C.V. Javin, Matt Stenta and Sam Newton gave an outstanding display in the 12-23 knot south-south easterly breeze to score a convincing victory in race 1 on the 100 Australian 18-foot skiff championship on Sydney Harbour on the first race of the 2022 Nationals. Andu grabbed the lead at the first windward mark and after a brief capsize late on the next pinnacle run, led all the way to defeat the SMEG team of Michael Coxon, Ricky Bridge and Zach Barnabas by 48 seconds. The defending champion Take-Two, team of Jack McCartney, Charlie Wyatt and Lewis Brake was well back in the fleet after a disappointing first leg and had to battle hard to come back on the finish a further 39 seconds behind SMEG in third place. Harris Price Ragan Famish Hotel team finished fourth after another consistent performance followed by Finport Finance with Keegan York and Nook Sailing, Shang Langman. Race 2. Gusty 1823 South South Esterly winds produced spectacular action packed 18 foot skiff racing for the large spectator fleet on day 2 of the 100 Australian 18 footer championship on Sydney Harbour. In race 2 of the championship, Knox Sailing grabbed an early 20 second lead over Smeg at the windward mark on the first of two laps, but the Smeg team's downwind speed was impressive and Smeg quickly opened up a break of more than 30 seconds when the fleet headed for home on the second lap of the course. Andu was also showing exceptional downwind speed and was coming fast in pursuit of Smeg as the two flying machines raced to the finish line with just 11 seconds separating them as Smeg crossed the line to take the race. Nook Sailing was a further 30 seconds back in third place, followed by Yandu, Tech 2 and Ragan Famish Hotel. Race 3. The breeze was fresh when the fleet got away for the start of race 3 of the championship with Andu, Lazarus Capital Partners, Fisher and Pekel with Jordan Geddes and Smeg all battling for the lead of the port tack across the harbour to the mouth of Rose Bay. Andu was powering ahead as the fleet worked more into the bay and, as spinnakers were set for the run back to the bottom mark, held a 20 seconds lead over Lazarus Capital Partners, race to winner Smeg and Ragan Famish Hotels. The talented team was in a superb form and over the two laps increased the lead to finally cross the finish line, one minute four seconds ahead of Take 2, with Lazarus Capital Partners in first place, just eight seconds behind Take 2. Ragan Famish was finally six seconds further back in fourth place, ahead of Nox Sailing and Yandu. Race 4. Unlike Sunday's gusty 18 23 knot south south Esterly winds, Monday racing originally began in light, fruky conditions before a solid breeze came in. Unfortunately, the first attempt to start race 4 was abandoned at the first windward mark as the fleet had been split into two distinct groups 
and it wasn't until one hour after the scheduled start time that Monday's racing finally got on the way. The Oak Double Bay Four Pines, including Aaron Everhurt, John Coulet and Charlie Gundy, were back to best form and despite strong challenging through the race, were able to hold off Sean and Partners Financial Services with Steve Thomas, Lynn Sested and Tom Quigley to win by 6 seconds with Andu as further 16 seconds back in 3rd place. Smeg finished 4th, followed by Ragan Famish Hotel and Queensland Citec, skippered by Dave Ather. Race 5. In the last race of this big weekend, Andu won the start with some superb work by skipper C.V. Jarvin and the team and was never added over the entire course to win by a very impressive 1 minute 45 seconds margin over Take 2 with Rag and Famish Hotel and over 26 seconds further back in 3rd place. Smeg finished 4th, followed by Lazarus Capital Partners and Race 4 winner, the Oak Double Bay Four Pines. Resume. The Andu team of C.V. Jarvins, Matt Stenta and Sam Newton showed an outstanding form over the first three days racing of the Australian 18-footer championship on Sydney Harbour. On total points with three wins and two other podium placings for the five races sailed so far, Andu has already established a 19-point lead over the defending champion take-two of Jack McCartney, Charlie Wyatt and Lewis Brake with a rookie Rag and Famish Hotel team of Harry Price, Josh McKnight and Harry Hall in third place. Allowing for each team discarding its worst performance to date, Andu has a total of 5 points. Race 2 winner Smeg is next on 11 points, followed by Take 2 on 12, Rag and Famish Hotels on 16, Nook Sailing with Sean Longman and Lazarus Capital Partners with Marcus Ashley Jones tied on 22. Fitness is second to none, his commitment to the team and the results that he's had as a younger sailor coming through the academy that we had initially, having won the Youth America's Cup and then getting involved with CLGP and other events at the top of the sport. He's a huge talent and one of those sailors you're going to see for many years to come in both the America's Cup and other competitions right at the top of the sport of sailing. Cette année, il y a une super nouvelle. Je vais avoir un nouveau bateau pour aller encore plus vite et surtout pour sauver encore plus d'enfants. On a eu l'opportunité de de faire un bateau qui répondait à l'ensemble des objectifs qu'on s'était fixés, qui nous a été apporté par le, le chantier Black Pepper, qui était de faire une évolution du bateau d'Armel Tripon lors du Vendée Globe 2020. 
qui est une carène de SCO. On considère que c'est une carène qui avait un coup d'avance. Et en faisant une évolution de ce bateau, on réutilise des moules existants, ce qui nous évite d'avoir à investir dans un nouvel outillage. On réutilise également une partie des études euh, qui avaient été faites pour ce bateau. Donc là encore, on réduit l'investissement dans de nouvelles études. Lors de la dernière campagne de Vendée Globe, on a vu pas mal d'architectes s'exprimer sur euh, les, les nouveaux bateaux. Et il y avait un bateau sur le dernier Vendée Globe qui avait une forme un peu différente. Comment tu as décidé de faire cette forme La grosse difficulté sur ces bateaux offshore, c'est quand tu, quand tu navigues avec les vagues, donc au portant, euh, bah, tu vas plus vite que les vagues et au final bah, tu, tu, tu rattrapes les vagues et avec les bateaux pointus on a un peu tendance à, à, à s'enfoncer dans les vagues qu'on rattrape. Quoi. Donc les SCO c'est des bateaux un peu, un peu spatulés à l'avant et qui au lieu de rentrer dans l'eau et pousser la flotte de chaque côté, bah, ils vont euh, pousser la flotte vers le bas et en fait ils vont rester au-dessus de l'eau. Ça a été testé en 6,50, ça a vachement bien marché. Et puis petit à petit, ça a été développé aussi sur d'autres classes. Et puis euh, bah, l'IMOCA qu'on a fait pour Arnel, c'était le premier à vraiment exploiter ce concept-là. Le parcours du Vendée Globe, c'est pas seulement euh, des bords de vitesse sur mer plate euh, au large de l'Orient. Donc on se rend compte que bah, dans le Grand Sud, les bateaux ils sont utilisés à 70% de leur capacité. Et nous, l'objectif, ce n'est pas forcément d'augmenter la vitesse de pointe, mais vraiment la vitesse moyenne pour accélérer sur un parcours devant des globes. Ça implique aussi le confort du skipper, parce que c'est sûr que si le, le bateau est invivable, bah, le skipper il, il est poussé à redescendre un peu le, le level euh, qu'il met dans le bateau, parce que ça devient insupportable. Quoi qu'il y a des moments où on peut aller très vite, avec nos bateaux, mais euh, à l'intérieur, on est en mode survie où euh, ça bouge tellement que j'arrive pas à faire manger. Ouais, J'ai vu quelques, quelques vidéos d'Armel Tripon et il a eu un record. Je crois qu'il y a un tronçon du Tour du Monde où il était le bateau le plus rapide. D'équateur à équateur. Donc, le, le concept intéressant du SCO, c'est et sa largeur de carène et l'effet spatulé euh, à l'avant qui, qui l'un et l'autre permettent de développer plus de puissance sur, sur le bateau. Bah les, les bateaux qui sont, euh, qui sont un peu spatulés comme ça, la, la spatule, en fait, euh, dès que ça va toucher l'eau, ça va vraiment euh, relever le nez du bateau. Quoi. Comme des vas... skis. J'ai hâte d'essayer. Mmh.